Good afternoon, Loveland members. It's so good to be here. My name is Minister Frederick Dodson, and uh, I'm just so glad to be in front of you this morning, this afternoon, and uh, we're just going to look at God's Word as we're in this season of, of Passion Week. You've heard a lot of good speakers so far, and I hope that what God has for me to say to you will add to, the, to your spirits and, and, and bring you closer in your work, walk with God. I'm going to be reading from Gospels, the Gospel of Luke, Luke's Gospel, the 23rd chapter, starting with the 32nd verse to the 34th verse. So before I do that, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, we thank you for this time that we have to spend in your word, Father. Oh Lord, I ask that you would just take me out of the equation right now. Speak to someone, someone who will listen, Father, someone who you, this is intended for, Lord, that they might be drawn closer to you by your Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, I pray that you would anoint these words and anoint this time that we spend in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke's Gospel, 23rd chapter, at the, starting with the 32nd verse, and it reads as follows. There were also two others, criminals, led with him to be put to death. And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the second sentence in fulfillment of David's prophecy in Psalm 22, the word says, and they divided his garments and cast lots. You know, we live in a country that idealizes the concept of freedom. You know, the idea of freedom is a core principle that's given to us, written down in the Declaration of Independence says, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That word liberty is what I'm going to focus on because it's synonymous with freedom. And it's amplified in the United States Constitution by a set of amendments called the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights protects our freedom of speech. We hear a lot about that today, our freedom of religion. We don't hear much about that. And then the right to bear and keep, keep and bear arms, we hear a whole lot about that, along with other protections that it mentions. But during this Passion Week, as we commemorate the supreme life-giving sacrifice of Jesus on Calvary, I want to just take a few moments to focus on Jesus' idea of what freedom is and the example that he left for us to follow in terms of his first utterance from the cross. Hmm. His first utterance from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was on the mind of Christ as he was being crucified, tortured, in the extreme. Can you imagine? Put yourself in that situation. We stub our toe, and what's the word, first word that comes out of your mouth? We get in an accident or something, and what's, what, what, what do we express under, under intense pain? What you express under intense pain will give you an idea of who you serve. Well, I give you an idea of what's inside of you. Jesus said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. That was, that was the heart of God speaking to God. Forgive them. That word forgive is first mentioned in Genesis, in the 50th chapter of Genesis. 
when Joseph's brothers, after the death of their father, came to him and said, uh, Daddy told us to uh, tell you to forgive us. They had sold him in slavery, and now they were at his mercy. And Joseph uttered those immortal words that, that give us another principle, another true principle of how God is. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. In the New Testament, we see 1 John 1 and 9, which says, if you confess your sins, he, God, is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Now, in the Old Testament, the word, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament was nasa. It's spelled N-A-S-A, but it's pronounced nasa. And it carries with it the idea of lifting up or unburdening one, lifting up one's burden or, or helping one to carry his burden. In the New Testament, the word used in Luke 23, 34, when Jesus says, forgive them, the New, the New Testament word is aphiomi, aphiomi. And it has the context of to send away, to give up, or just to let go. Now, both of these words point towards a central principle of freedom. Freedom. Hmm. For example, I'll give you a couple of illustrations. In a courtroom, you have a judge and you have a jury. And suppose you stand before the judge and the jury and, and you've been brought in the courtroom for uh, an offense, whatever it is. Might, could be minor, could be major. But once you've been sentenced, if you found guilty, the judge has the responsibility to pass sentence on you. But he has an option. Depending upon the laws and depending on the, on the infraction, he can either sentence you to penalty or he has the option of giving you leniency and setting you free. Now, when it comes to individuals, you and I, and someone offends us, we act as judge and jury in that situation. And we, too, have an option. But here's the rub. Here's the rub. Here's the rub. Our failure to forgive or to hold a person in unforgiveness places a sentence of guilt on us and puts us in prison. We are put in the prison, prison of anger, prison of resentment, prison of rage, prison of hate. In that prison, <laughs> those sentiments in that prison can lead to all kinds of things, murder, to other sins. But in, the, in, in God's courtroom, God is intimately involved. And forgiveness is so important an idea that these were the first words that Jesus uttered when he was nailed to the cross. Forgive them. Forgive them. With those words, he not only showed his love, his mercy, his compassion, but he gave us an example of what we're supposed to do under intense pressure or when we've been harmed or hurt by somebody. Our first reaction needs to be forgiveness so that we can remain free. Peter came to to Jesus in Matthew 18, 21, and 22, and he asked him, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother who sinned against me? Shall I forgive him seven times? And Peter thought he was being magnanimous when he said seven times. Jesus said, no, 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 no. But I say unto you seven times 70. What was he saying? Jesus wants us to develop an attitude of forgiveness. 
And also, the other illustration he wants us to understand is how much we need forgiveness, how many times we need forgiveness. Think about it. How many times have you asked the Lord for forgiveness? Any, have you kept record? Anybody know how many times they've asked the Lord to forgive them? How many times have you asked somebody in passing, casually, to forgive me? Oh, pardon me. Excuse me. How many times? In each of those instances, what you're really asking for is forgiveness. How many times have you needed others to forgive you? Or worse still, how many times have we needed forgiveness and didn't ask for it? Hmm. I used to ask a question, and this is a, for another sermon. I used to ask this question. We know that God forgives the sinner when he comes to him and asks for forgiveness and repentance. We know that, because God will forgive him. But will he forgive the Christian that doesn't ask for forgiveness? Forgiveness is not always easy. Sometimes the hurt is so deep, so devastating. And God understands that. God understands that. But it's always necessary because it's better than the alternative. Forgiveness is an act of mercy. It's an act of love. But here it is. It's an act of self-love to keep yourself free. Matthew says it this way in the Lord's Prayer. Matthew 6, 14 and 15, he says, Jesus says, it, for if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So the forgiveness is for us. The forgiveness, the act of forgiveness is more for us than it is for the, per for the perpetrator. But then here's the real issue. Here's the real issue. Because, see, we're all guilty of an infraction. It's called sin. And we're all bound under the bondage of sin. David put it this way in Psalm 51 and 5. and I'm, It's from the, from the Passion Translation. David says it this way, Lord, I've been a sinner from birth, from, my mother's, from the moment my mother conceived me. Adam sinned. And that sinful nature is passed down from generation to generation to generation, down to me, down to you. Because Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So my friends, what I want to express to you this, this afternoon, real freedom, real freedom lies in salvation. That's where real freedom lies. It lies in salvation. For the Christian, we're mandated by God to forgive. But for those of you who have not, who have not given your life to Christ, God is calling you right now to ask him for forgiveness. And he'll do it. He'll do it. Do it. All you have to say, Father, Forgive me of my sins. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ. He died on the cross for my sins. That he is Lord. So, Lord, please, I would like Jesus to be the Lord of my life. Those simple words, those simple words are all it takes to start you on a path road of real freedom. If you said those words from your heart, you're on that pathway right now. Father, I just want to thank you for this moment that we've had to spend with you to express your idea of what freedom is. Oh God, I thank you for those who've listened. 
God, I thank you that your, that your word has gone forth and it will not return unto you void. Thank you, Lord. Hey, guys. Hey, thank you for watching. Some of you made the best decisions of your life while you were watching the end of that message. You committed your life to Jesus Christ. And if you do, we are excited for you. We want to tell you congratulations. You just made the best decision of your life. That decision changed your destiny and your whole life from the moment you were born till right now was leading up to that moment. Now we want to help you follow through with that decision to follow Jesus. At the bottom of your screen, you're going to see this website, lovelandchurch.org. If you go to our website, lovelandchurch.org, you'll see a link that says respond to God. Respond to God. Click on that link. You'll see a form that we want you to fill out, and it'll send us your information. We're not going to give that information to anybody else. All we're going to do with that information is reach out to you so that we can support you and help you follow through with your decision. You might have some questions now that you've given your life to Jesus Christ. What's next? How do I handle this? How do I talk to God? Those are all questions that we had ourselves when we came to Jesus, and we want to help you find the answers. So go to lovelandchurch.org, click on Respond to God, fill out the form, and we're going to get back with you very quickly so we can help you get to know your God better. God bless you.